Jesus, because of who he is and what he's done and all the promises fulfilled by him, now you get to be who you are forever because you are tucked away in the Messiah. You're, you know, uh, sealed and secured in him. So Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, it says, look, referring to Jesus, it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Meaning this, God intended to bring many children into his glory so they could be adopted as children of God. That required the founder of their salvation, being Jesus, to be made perfect through his suffering. So notice in Ephesians chapter 3, we saw all of the promises that are now true of us and apply to us. They're only for us and, and apply to us because we're in Christ. Galatians chapter 4, because he's the son and he's born of woman under law, now we can be adopted as children of God. Now Hebrews 2 builds on that idea. It's not just that Jesus had to be sent. It's not just that Jesus had to be one of us and fulfill the law perfectly. It's actually that he had to suffer righteously and justly for all of human evil across time because he's done that you and i get to be those many sons and daughters that are brought into glory meaning you now are children of god because someone else who was good enough powerful enough perfect and valuable enough he's actually paid the price and died to actually pay our debt in full because of who he is, you and I get to be now who we are. So this is one of the fundamental uh, ideas about our identity you have to understand. Who you are now has nothing to do with what you can produce, how well you can obey, how much you can resist sin, how much you can do for God. It has nothing to do with performance and, and accomplishments and success and achievements. It has nothing to do with that. Who you are now forevermore is based on who Jesus is for you. Get that like as much as you can lock that into your brain. That who I am now forevermore is only because of who Jesus is for me. Number two, not only is our identity in him and because of him and through him, but we need to establish that God alone and I say that in all caps, alone. You ever watch the show Alone on Netflix? My wife and I are loving that show. God alone determines your value and your identity. So if God calls you something, if he says you're something, if he, like he comes to Gideon, O oh mighty man of valor, and he's cowering in a wine press, hiding all the food and course from the Midianites, he doesn't seem like a mighty warrior of valor. But if God calls you something... You better believe that's who you are. And you're at least going to be fitted for that and become that if you're not right now. But God decides who you are. He determines your value. You and I live in a culture where we're taught to let other people close to us determine our value and identity. You've been trained to like find a sense of value from what your parents say about you and getting their approval, whether it's in school, whether it's in sports, whether it's in work and career or getting a certain place in life or doing stuff for them you've been taught and trained to find identity and value in what someone else says about you and in whether or not they approve of you that's why the, the entire culture we're surrounded by is constantly after likes and subscribers and followers and like me and approve of me because they they've fallen into the lie that if I just get so-and-so to approve of me, I can finally be valuable. And they've given someone else the power to define who they are and define how valuable they are. And that's simply not true. Because no one else, including myself, gets to determine who I am or how valuable I am. Only the Creator has that authority. And I know this pushes against the grains of culture, where, again... The mantra of our day is you decide what you are. You decide if you're a turtle. You decide if you're a girl. You decide if you're fill in the blank. The thing is, when it comes to identity and the, the value and the essence and the nature of a person, 
we don't get to change that. We don't get to decide that. We get to discover who we are, but who we are has nothing to do with worldly titles and labels and temporary, you know, things that we have. So you have to get to the point where you are not what your parents say you are. You're not what your pastor says you are. You're, of course, they can align themselves with the truth and call out the truth in you. And they can say things that are true. But at the end of the day, no one person on the planet and no group of people can define who I am and how valuable I am. This is the best news ever. Because if God says you're something, and if he's determined your X amount of value, then guess what? No one else gets to have a say in it. So the whole world can be against you. You can be against yourself. You can be fighting against that yourself. But if God says you are fill in the blank, nothing's going to change that. So let me take you to Romans 4.17 to reinforce what I'm saying. And again, this is we know this like intuitively of Christ, as Christians. Like we know, well, God alone decides who I am because he's the only one that made me. No one else did. But Romans 4.17 it talks about how God decided Abraham would be the father of our faith, okay? And so if God's going to say you're something, you are that, or, you'll, or he'll make you that. So this is what Paul says. He says, as it is written, this is what God says of Abraham, and Paul's quoting God. I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God of whom he believed. Here's the quotation. It ends right here. God looks at Abraham and goes, I've made you the father of many nations. Did Abraham become the father of many nations by his own efforts and labor? Was he qualified to be that? Did he educate himself into that? Did he earn that title? No. Did Abraham wake up one morning and decide, you know what? I'm going to be the father of a brand new faith system. Nope. This is God saying, I have made you the father of many nations. And end quote, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that don't exist. I want you to catch that. God has the power to things that don't pr exist right now. He has the power and the authority to call something non-existent into existence. He can say, let there be light. He can say, let there be land coming out of the waters. He can say, let there be oxygen. He can say, let there be, you know, whatever it is, waters in the sky. He can decide to create out of nothing. And so if God has the power and the authority to create what doesn't currently exist and bring that into existence, then the same wisdom principle and truth applies to you and me. Not that we can do that, but that if God says we are something, he's going to bring that into existence. He's going to make that a reality. Because reality conforms to the word of God. Meaning if God speaks, reality has to adjust to what God has spoken. So if God says something about you, well now reality has to adjust to what the, the spoken word of God is about you. So if God looks at Abraham, who is not the father of many nations currently, and he says, I've made you that, well, now Abraham's going to effectively become that. And nothing's going to stop that. Because what God says is true. Even if it's currently not a reality, it becomes true by the very fact that God said it. 